it's now my pleasure to introduce our next session's presenters. I'm gonna start by introducing our fireside chat host, Beth Battlingo. Beth is the CEO of Healthy Women, a nonprofit organization that's providing women with in-depth, objective, medically approved information on a broad range of women's health issues. She's a great partner of 2020 Mom. Beth is also an RN and holds degrees in political science and business and public administration. Next is Dr. Stuart Lustick. He's a board certified child psychiatrist and the national medical executive for Cigna Behavioral Health. Stuart's been with us at the forum for several years in a row and he's always so much fun to have. We're grateful for you, Stuart, and also grateful for Cigna being the longest standing sponsor of this event, nine years and running. And next, I'm interested in introducing to you Jacqueline Kent Marvick. She's a second year PhD student and a pre-doctoral fellow at the University of Utah, the College of Nursing. The focus of Jacqueline's research is on understanding how postpartum social networks influence health. And they're all here today to be talking about loneliness and resilience in the maternal population. We're so glad to have all three of you um, with us. And I'm gonna first turn it over to Dr. Stuart Lustig, who's gonna be presenting the research that Cigna has led in this space. So Stuart, welcome to the main stage. Well, Joy, thanks so much. It is a pleasure to be with you all uh, yet again this year. I have such fond memories for our gathering last year in Los Angeles and uh, glad to be back, even though it is virtual this year. Uh, what a year it has been. Uh, I'm going to summarize very briefly, just as a kickoff really to this session, uh, some resilience research that we have been doing. And boy, what a time to think about resilience. Uh, Cigna as a global health services company has been dedicated to the health, well-being, and peace of mind of those we serve for many years now. And we're really interested in anything uh, that impacts the intersection of body and mind because we take a very holistic approach to health. Uh, and so on the next slide, I'll just uh, share with you the thought leadership journey that we have been through in recent years. And I, I won't, uh, in the interest of time, cover everywhere we've been, but most recently in the last few years, uh, we took a really hard look at loneliness. And that was something that we talked about last year uh, in this forum. Uh, we did two studies on loneliness, one among uh, 20,000 uh, people in the United States, and then another specifically among 8,000 workers. We talked about those results uh, here. And then the pandemic hit, of course, last, uh, last winter and spring. And so we were all isolating, sheltering in place, quarantining, social distancing, physical distancing, only compounding the difficulties with, uh, with loneliness. And so this past summer, we set out to study uh, resilience. And I'd like to show you on the next slide uh, some of what we found, because I think it has significant implications for all of us, particularly those of us who are new mothers or rearing uh, children. Uh, what we found, first of all, with loneliness, just to set the stage, is a 7% increase from the previous year uh, in 2019. So this brings us up to about three out of five Americans struggling with some degree of loneliness. And on the next slide, uh, I'll show you the age breakdown. And this is important, uh, what we saw in both studies, and this is a refresher for those of you who, that were here with us last year. Uh, Gen Z, the youngest uh, generation, ages 18 to 22, they were the most lonely. These are loneliness scores on the loneliness index that I'm showing you. Those are the numbers in the 40s uh, primarily. And so you can see year over year, uh, they remain lonely. Uh, and on the next slide, we're gonna jump now into resilience. And what we found in our collaboration with the Resilience Research Center in Canada uh, was that when we used uh, two measures of resilience, looking in both kids as well as young adults, including moms, uh, that resilience also was at risk. In other words, not the optimal resilience score that we would hope for. Resilience was also at risk in three out of five uh, of the folks that we surveyed. So we were concerned by that. Uh, that's certainly a significant percentage. I'll show you a little bit of the breakdown on the next slide. 
uh, where you can see actually some good news. What this shows you here is that kids are inherently resilient. We're all born uh, regardless of our demographic background, uh, where we're growing up, we all uh, are born with an innate amount of resilience. And then that resilience drops off to the lowest point. Uh, and we see that again in the young adults in the ages 18 to 22, 23. Uh, year old range, and then people regain some of that resilience uh, by the time that they are parents. Um, and we'll uh, perhaps in the Q&A have time to talk more specifically about um, mothers in this age range. Um, but I wanted to show you just a big picture to kick off this session, uh, this curve, so you could get a general sense. And on the next slide, uh, here you see that kids in particular are impacted. What we find is that uh, social media in particular seems to have an impact. Heavy, heavy users seem to be less resilient than those who are using resilient less, uh, using social media less. And this uh, makes a certain amount of sense because uh, what we also found is that the extent to which you are connected with your community, uh, with other people, with your parents, your teachers, your friends, uh, coaches and so forth, you're more likely to be uh, resilient as well if you are connected uh, with other people around you. Next, please. And here I just wanted to show you at the other end of the age range what's going on with workers. Most of Cigna's clients are large companies or smaller companies, and they're very interested in uh, the workforce. And so what we found is that uh, the more you are working, essentially, the more you are resilient. And uh, the less you're working, the less likely you are to report resilience. And because this was a cross-sectional study, this one of 16,500 people across the United States, uh, we don't know which way those causative arrows are pointing. Uh, but suffice it to say that if you're in an employer, uh, if you are an employer or working in a uh, large work environment, uh, there's the opportunity to impact the resilience of those who are in your setting. Uh, next. Uh, these are some of the other things that are associated with, uh, with greater resilience. Community, I already mentioned. Uh, so whether you're a kid in a school setting or someone who is connected with work or people in your neighborhood or your family, uh, your ability to connect with others means you're more likely to be resilient. And why is that? Well, it's probably because of the way we think about what resilience really is. It's the ability to uh, navigate towards the resources that you need to overcome adverse circumstances in your life. And many of those resources are going to be either other people or they're going to be resources provided by other people. So staying connected with others really does have an impact on, on resilience. Inclusivity and authenticity. We found time and again that the people who told us that they felt like they could be their true selves with their friends, with their coworkers, they didn't have to hide who they were that was associated with greater resilience. And uh, finally, those who felt aligned with their company's mission, they felt like their company was bringing greater value to the world, they were making a, a meaningful contribution at work, uh, those folks were also more resilient as well. So I'm gonna leave you here on a positive note. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, we'll skip over uh, the additional slides and come back later in the Q&A as we have time. And so again, I'd like to say how delighted I am to be back with all of you again this year and looking forward to uh, chatting with you some more in the Q&A. Thanks, Dr. Elastic. That was great. Um, do we have uh, my slides by chance? Well, I'm they excited. They are coming right back up right now, Jack. Okay. Thank you for bearing with us. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. This is my first time, and I'm jealous that I missed you all in Los Angeles last time. But hopefully we'll um, we'll get to be back together again next year. Um, I want to take just a, a second. Um, you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. Thank you. And um, touch on why I think this is an important topic: perinatal loneliness. Um, we have abundant evidence that our social relationships are important to our health, 
And we now have strong evidence that loneliness is associated with morbidity and mortality risk comparable to smoking up to 15 cigarettes per day. Um, over the course of the next few slides, um, in addition to highlighting some of our findings, I hope to paint a picture that this population um, of pregnant people um, and new parents are at high risk for loneliness and that this group is an ideal um, focus for our loneliness amelioration efforts, especially um, because our children are part of that um, uh, family uh, makeup as well. Um, okay, so go ahead and uh, advance for me, please. Thank you. Um, so the primary gap that we identified is that research is severely limited on perinatal loneliness. Just 32 of our 131 articles met inclusion criteria, and we kept our inclusion criteria pretty broad so that we could capture um, loneliness when it wasn't a primary target of study. Um, so in 32 of the articles, um, 32 of the 131, it was a primary focus of study. And in the rest, um, the 99 uh, remaining studies, um, loneliness emerged from the participants as a um, topic that was important to their health and relevant to um, the research topic. Um, so that, that was interesting. Um, I want to uh, take just a second to highlight this first article that crops up in 1964. Um, it was published in an issue of Nursing Mirror uh, by a uh, woman named A.H. Kane, who was a nurse and a home health visitor with a sociology degree. And in this article, she discusses the loneliness of young mothers that she worked with. She describes uh, first-time mothers as being at particular risk for loneliness, and she discusses a number of um, considerations for addressing this issue. She primarily argues for um, the use of home health visitors as um, they're well positioned to identify loneliness in um, the people that they work with. Um, you know, she, she illustrated how um, uh, home health visitors uh, take time to establish a relationship and understand where um, these parents are. So um, the, um, the help that they provide, the recommendations that they provide really are tailored to those parents. Um, so despite its publication date, it really struck me as very timely, especially in light of the complexities of the pandemic. Um, the next article doesn't crop up until 1978, and it's an article profiling the personality um, variables of child abusers. And a tendency toward isolation and loneliness was one of six personality clusters that were identified in this sample of child abusers. Um, for the sake of time, I'll just uh, draw your attention to how each decade um, the number of articles um, increases with um, you know, quite a few in 2010. And if you look at the, the last line, that lightest blue line, that's 2020 alone. There were 21 articles in 2020 alone, and that's nearly one third of the articles in the entire decade before. So I think what we're seeing is that um, people are starting to take notice of this topic and um, really see that uh, there's value in um, this study. Uh, three of the articles published in 2020 were related to COVID, so I'll take just a minute to touch on those. Um, one of them was with uh, uh, participants uh, who were pregnant living in Ireland, and 44% um, of their participants reported low mood related to loneliness and missing their friends and family. Um, another one that I'll highlight was from UK Moms, um, with children under the age of one. And in their uh, participant uh, sample, they found 59% of their participants were lonely. Um, they looked at predictors for um, poor or better mental health, and they found that poor mental health was related to when moms had to travel for work, um, when they were struggling to afford food for the family, and if their family income was less than 30,000 um, pounds per year. Predictors for better mental health were having support with mom's own health, um, 
being able to contact and interact with infant support groups and greater age of the infant. So I think that that's a really great illustration of how um, we're dealing with um, struggles or you know, having support resources, just like uh, Dr. Lustig said. Um, uh, please advance to the next slide. So we'll jump into uh, parental loneliness now. Um, oh, actually, uh, just quickly, um, this is a word. Oh, no, yeah, go ahead to the next slide. Um, this is a word cloud. Um, the frequency of um, uh, focus of research is illustrated here. So you can see adolescents were most frequently the focus of these studies, followed up by perinatal mental health. Um, other important um, focuses for research were immigrants, refugees, um, high-risk pregnancies, and infants with critical care needs, as well as first-time moms. Okay, we can skip to the next slide, please. Okay, parental loneliness. Um, so I think what's really important here is um, the idea of transitional loneliness. It's particularly relevant to parenthood because this is a time of rapid transition um, that can disrupt uh, existing social connections due to parenting responsibilities and that lack of time to socialize. Additionally, once these patterns of social disconnection set in, they become hard to break. Um, loneliness itself can become a barrier to social connection and our intimate relationships don't necessarily protect us uh, parents from loneliness. And in fact, becoming a parent can have negative effects on intimate relationships. One study found that lonelier parents were uh, more likely to report um, problems in their intimate partner relationships. Um, one, one qualitative study that did um, set out to study uh, perinatal loneliness or postpartum loneliness rather, um, found that mothers experienced this transitional time as a challenge that was out of step with their expectation of becoming a mother. Mothers felt prepared for childbirth, but not for what followed. And they compared themselves with a cultural narrative of the effortless mother and felt isolated in their experience of motherhood, which they believed did not conform to the norm. They felt vulnerable to the judgment of others and this vulnerability acted as a barrier to relating to others. Mothers felt trapped in their house because of mothering responsibilities. And even when socializing, they often felt separated from the group when, um, parenting responsibilities required that they leave the group. These mothers anticipated that parenting would be much more of a shared responsibility and um, often felt as though that the support that was provided by their partners lacked the empathy um, that they, um, they felt their, their struggles um, illustrated. Our scoping review found conflicting data about whether younger or older mothers might be at greater risk for loneliness, but more data indicated that younger mothers are at risk, which uh, just like Dr. Lustig's um, results show, um, you know, this is in alignment with loneliness data from across the lifespan that really does indicate that um, uh, people transitioning out of adolescence and into early adulthood are at greater risk. And um, relating to protective factors, and again, um, really in alignment with Dr. Lustig's um, resilience findings, um, there was one, uh, just one social network analysis study um, uh, looking at the postpartum period. And when I say social network, I don't mean social media, but I mean the network of relationships around mom. So family, friends, community members, um, that surround uh, the new parent uh, found that network cohesion or density, stay with me for just one sec, was protective of loneliness. And what we mean by density, um, that refers to the degree to which people within that network are connected with each other. So not just to mom, but they have relationships with each other. And the author found that this um, 
the authors of this study um, believe that those high density networks contribute to a sense of belonging and community for the new mother. And they also hypothesize that these networks may provide coordinated support and resources that less dense networks do not provide. Um, advance to the next slide, please. So looking at perinatal mental health, our quantitative studies have shown that loneliness has a direct effect on postpartum depression and mother-infant bonding, and that loneliness is significantly higher in depressed than non-depressed um, people. Uh, depression, rather than loneliness, has more frequently been studied as a focus of qualitative study, and this is really where the bulk of our qualitative results came from, was from those postpartum depression um, studies. Um, what, what we found is that um, people with postpartum depression frequently feel as though their communication attempts fail, um, resulting in these people further isolating themselves from their social connections, um, feeling rejected in these communication attempts, self-reinforces loneliness and feelings of alienation, um, resulting in um, their feeling dissatisfied with their social support's ability to help them in their time of need. Um, and often they even stop trying to um, communicate um, altogether out of a sense of guilt for their depression. Um, participants from these studies frequently shared that what they need most to help them with their depression would be the ability to talk to other people who had experienced sim similar feelings of depression. This type of interaction with others with shared experience affirms that people are not alone in their struggles and that they are strong enough to work through it together. And participation in such groups is felt as a relief uh, from the nightmare of postpartum depression and the first step um, in recovery where isolation and loneliness can be peeled away, allowing for hope um, to emerge. Uh, next slide, last slide, I promise. <laughs> Um, so for me, the, the main takeaway from this review is that we're just getting started with these, um, with our study on perinatal loneliness, and that a focus on loneliness can be really um, an effective way for us to understand common difficulties experienced during the transitional time of pregnancy and new parenthood. And additionally, as we see that burden load, um, you know, increased struggles, um, those people become um, even more at risk for loneliness. So I'm looking forward to our conversation now and I apologize if that took a little bit, a few minutes longer than it should have. So Beth, unmute please. Sorry. What I was saying is thank you both for such great slides and commentary. Um, and I look forward to uh, today's conversation. At Healthy Women, we know well-being is, is at the core of health and women are at the core of our homes and, of, and society. So I am truly honored to be leading the conversation today with you. So the first question is for both Dr. Lustig and Jacqueline. This population, was already at risk for loneliness. Why is that? And how does technology play into things? Who wants to go first? I'm happy to, or if you, if you're poised, you can. Go right, go right ahead, Jacqueline. You take okay. the floor and then I'll uh, try to think of something intelligent to say. <laughs> oh dear. Um, I think, I think the transitional aspect really helps is, you know, it helps explain um, why loneliness is prevalent in this group. So when, um, when we talk about transitional loneliness, um, it's a type of loneliness that occurs during a rapid transition in life. So it's often associated with um, the death of a loved one or um, the transition to college, things like that, where really overnight our life um, completely transforms. And obviously, uh, becoming a parent is, you know, in, firmly in that category. Um, so I think it's just it's it's wrapped up in um, life is going along at a normal pace. There's lots of uh, repetition and and normalcy and then all of a sudden 
all of our routines have changed and it's part of those struggles. Um, as far as uh, the technology piece goes, I'm interested to see if Dr. Lustig has something more yeah. intelligent to say than I do, but just from the, the literature that I've read, it seems like moms prefer the face-to-face, uh, -face, you know, in-person um, interactions when possible. But when tying this back to loneliness, the most important piece, and this relates to technology also, is that um, moms are able, or uh, parents are able to connect to people that they um, uh, feel like they connect with. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, competition or, um, you know, feelings of, of disconnection enter that picture, that can really increase the loneliness and feelings of um, social alienation. So I'll add on to that. And by the way, first names are fine all the way, all, all around, although I certainly appreciate the, uh, the respect and the good intent. So uh, look, I'll, I'll comment first of all from a personal perspective, and then I'll talk about our data on this. Uh, as you look at me, you probably don't imagine, couldn't imagine that I have a four-year-old at home. Um, but I do, I know I just don't look old enough to have a four-year-old, but I do. And uh, I can remember when, when she was first born and as often happens in most cultures, the relatives descend, everybody comes over, everybody's helping. Uh, and then after a few weeks or a couple months or even longer, depending on the culture, uh, everyone goes away and it's you and the baby. And the most important piece of technology at that point, uh, which links you with another person is the baby monitor. And that's not a great antidote for loneliness. It's certainly a good uh, solution to take care of your kid in another room, uh, so you don't have to be in the whole room at the same time, but, but it is not the antidote to loneliness. So what we learned in our loneliness studies uh, was that uh, it's actually fairly complicated, uh, so, but I'll, I'll try to unpack a little bit with uh, what we asked about in terms of technology was essentially about social connectedness through various social media platforms, uh, whether it was Facebook or, or Twitter or others. And uh, at first pass, it appeared that there was no association at all of, of heavy or light social media use and loneliness. It just didn't seem to matter. Well, then we looked a little bit at a more granular level. And what we found in fact was uh, it seemed to matter what type of social media you were using. And so if you were using something where you could uh, connect with others, post pictures, get responses from others, uh, the visual medium uh, and so forth, that seemed to be associated with less loneliness. Uh, but if you were using things where you were simply sending out text messages or that sort of thing, uh, that was actually associated with greater loneliness. And that was in the first study that we did. Uh, in the second study, uh, looking at workplace loneliness, um, it got a little bit more interesting because what we found is that heavy use uh, in general was associated with greater loneliness. Now in the first study, only those people who identified themselves as using social media too much were lonelier. Um, whereas in the second study, it was more of a, an absolute, are you using social media a lot or not? Uh, and so there was a, more, a bit tighter of a connection, I would say. Uh, and then fast forward to the resilience study that I just talked about, where again, we see people who are heavy, heavy users seem to be uh, less resilient. So I think uh, that is the connection with technology that we need to be careful about. So it's a great way to keep people connected potentially if you're not overusing it. And so, uh, you know, here we are all on a Zoom call together to be able to connect up. And, and if it weren't for uh, this kind of platform, it would be hard to have this meeting. Uh, then again, the meeting before this I had, I kept myself off of camera just so I could move around and stay limber and, and you know, have some, have a chance to, uh, you know, maintain my own uh, composure without getting too videoed out basically before going into this call. So it's, it's that balancing act, I think, uh, that we need to think about with social media, with, with uh, technology in general. Okay. So Dr. S um, Dr. Lustig, as a child psychiatrist, what do you think of resilience in mother parents and the impact on infants and children? 
Uh, well, that is a um, really good question. I'm going to uh, mop my brow as I think about it for seconds. Because the fireplace behind me is really warm. I don't know if you guys are all getting warm too from yeah. the heat, but boy, this you know these uh, springtime fires are, are uh, can heat us up. So let, let me tell you a little bit about resilience. And I'm, I'm glad you asked that, Beth, because we didn't have time to get into it uh, initially. But we did take a look at our data on resilience, particularly for mothers. And what we found, and then I'll qualify these, these uh, findings, is that resilience, uh, mothers between the ages of 18 to 45 uh, seem to have, uh, were less likely to have high resilience compared to uh, women in general of that age. So there's something about motherhood that is uh, potentially risky and, they are, and also uh, their physical and emotional health uh, was a little bit lower as well. Now, I will tell you that uh, it's the devil's in the details because what we also found is that higher resilience was associated with greater self-reports of physical health, greater self-reports of emotional health. And so I don't want to attribute all of the reduction uh, to motherhood specifically. Uh, the other qualifier is this is a broad age range. So uh, when we put together these stats uh, in preparation for talking with all of you today, uh, what I realized in thinking about this is we actually need to dig a little bit deeper because wouldn't it be possible that if you have a child at 18, uh, that might be a very different experience where you are already at risk for low resilience as we talked about with that resilience curve than if you have a, ch a, a child at 25 or 35 perhaps, or even older, where there may be other potential risks to uh, resilience uh, or, or mental or physical well-being. So it's complicated, um, but that was our uh, initial first take on the data. One other thing I'll just add though, Beth, is that um, working mothers who were, uh, well, it, put it this way, if you are a mother between that age range, 18 to, 20, uh, 18 to 45, but you are also working, that was associated with higher resilience. And it's a really interesting question to know how much of that increase in resilience is attributable to motherhood or to working, because we know that working in general, as I talked about earlier, is associated with, uh, with greater resilience. And I, I think about the uh, I mean, it's like being a super parent, right? To juggle, and especially all of us today in the midst of the pandemic, it's that much harder to uh, balance working and and parenthood and caretaking in general. And you have to have a certain amount of resilience in some ways to, to make all of that work. So uh, long-winded answer because the data is fairly complicated, but really interesting issues to, uh, to look at. To talk about. Um, so for both Dr. Lustig and Jacqueline, what are some of the strategies we can encourage moms to take personally to reduce loneliness and increase resilience? Jackie, do you want to go first? Jacqueline, do you want to go first? Sorry. Sure. Yeah, I, um, I'm glad that you posed this question because I think that there's something, um, there's something to be learned from feelings of loneliness, um, uh, a usefulness both for parents and for clinicians. Um, I think that, um, when we can, when we can take a moment to really appraise our feelings of loneliness, that we can, we can learn things from that. So, um, if, if you can think of a, a time, um, recently when you felt lonely, I'll, um, encourage you to, you know, try to dig into that for a minute. Um, when you start, um, you know, you can think of this almost like a, a, a mindfulness uh, type of practice, you know, tapping into that loneliness, that feeling, those feelings of loneliness and, and looking at what's going on there. Um, we can start problem solving through that. So let's say that, um, you know, as, as you look at that um, recent feeling of loneliness, you identify that you are struggling with something alone. So you can look at that first from the perspective of struggling. Well, what, what am I struggling with? You know, and, and check in with yourself there and, and try to really identify the boundaries of that. And um, I think that's where, you know, resilience comes in because, um, you know, resilience is that ability to be, um, level-headed in life and and to have some perspective um so you know first we're identifying 
you know, what our struggles are. And then the second part of that is alone. Like, why do you feel like you're struggling with that alone? Um, is it because you feel like you don't have um, someone who will understand your perspective? Um, is it because you feel like you don't have somebody that you can go to as a resource that can give you advice? Um, or maybe it's because you feel like you have no one in your um, social network who, um, who will understand what you're going through. And so I think it's, you know, that first step of really understanding what's going on that can be um, important and valuable both as a parent to try to take, um, you know, a little bit of ownership of what's going on. And then also as a clinician to try to, to get in there and to help in a meaningful way. Dr. Lustig? Well, it's, it's hard to improve upon what you just said, Dr. Kent Margaret, but I will try. <laughs> you know, I, I think you know, it, it's useful to think of loneliness uh, really as the cognitive construct, which it is. Um, and so the clinicians in the audience are going to instantly understand this, but it's really about uh, wanting something different, believing you should have something different from what you have in your life. The idea, you know, so there's nothing wrong with being a uh, solitary if solitude is what you are seeking in the moment, right? It's, 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 it's really loneliness is a definition that's based on the belief that you should have more people in your life or that you should have different types of relationships, deeper relationships uh, with people in your life. And so, uh, you know, following up on the idea of uh, social networks, for example, one of the things that is so powerful about that is it can potentially uh, connect you with the type of person or the groups of people that you think you ought to have. And I can tell you personally, uh, you know, as we've raised our daughter, uh, there have been times, less so now, but certainly, you know, in the uh, Harry Pardon period, first year of life, where it was vital to have uh, connections, uh, be it in person or online with, uh, I live in San Francisco, uh, you know, the, the Bay Area mothers or uh, networks like that, just to be able to ask questions, connect with others, suffer together, succeed together, uh, really have the opportunity to be with others when, uh, when it mattered most. And so I think uh, the advice for uh, clinicians here is to very actively explore with clients, with patients, how they can build that in their lives. And part of it is the therapeutic relationship. So there's no doubt that when someone is sitting with you as a clinician, uh, even if it's on a screen, you are connecting and you are providing a very important uh, type of interpersonal interaction that has real, uh, real staying power. I would never underestimate uh, the importance of the connection that clinicians have with uh, with patients when they're sitting there, but, but, but potentiating that, helping them to build even beyond that, skilling them up essentially uh, so that they can find those things uh, in their own lives, that kind of uh, activate and activating that needs to happen is, is something that can be very powerful for people. And so this question is for both of you and Jacqueline, I'll start with you first. What about universal policy changes, like changes in laws? Are there any opportunities here? Well, um, you know, the UK has been doing some really interesting things for a few years. So I think they're a good place to, to look. But I was um, so excited to learn last fall um, uh, that we in the US, we have a um, coalition to end social isolation and loneliness. And um, also part of that um, uh, foundation for social connection. And they're currently doing kind of a, an assessment of the, the US and, and trying to figure out where the need is. So I think that um, you know, this is an exciting prospect for um, our, our group, um, our population of interest um, to potentially help direct um, their attention toward um, the population of uh, new parents, um, you know, especially with, um, uh, you know, our, our children um, being raised in this environment and, and, and parents struggling largely on their own. Um, I think that this is, um, you know, potentially a really powerful way to impact people's lives and really understand um, those struggles that they're dealing with. Dr. Lustig? 
You know, I'll tell you where my mind went with that question, which is the, uh, again, the connection between mind and body and how integrated the two are. And one of the things we know about loneliness is uh, it impacts your physical health, it impacts your emotional health adversely, and it's quite expensive. There was a study done a few years ago in Texas looking at a number of ER uh, admissions, and what they found looking across, uh, it was the city of Houston, I believe, uh, is that uh, among uh, a, a population of people who are utilizing the ER, um, the vast majority of expenses were spent on a very small number of people who were going to the ER. And when they looked through the claims to figure out why people were showing up in the ER, what they, figured, what they found was that a lot of these people were lonely. And there was some type of uh, interpersonal uh, connection that they were getting when they would go to the ER for the third time that week and the nurse there would say, oh, Mr. So-and-so, how's your arm doing? Or whatever it was. And so as we think about how do we help people to overcome that, one of the things that we're starting to look at at Cigna, for example, and this is not a policy in, in terms of uh, you know, legal action, but just uh, an area for further exploration future state is what about using uh, social support groups that are focused on bringing people together who are grappling with, uh, for example, different medical conditions, uh, because we know that these psychosocial components of these various medical conditions, particularly those that are chronic, those that are stigmatized, uh, those where there may not be a lot of easy answers or the treatment's very uncomfortable, uh, you know, those are things where people may be looking for others like them to connect with. And so we're starting to look into those possibilities at this point and figure out if there's a way to help, uh, help our customers get uh, get the connections that they need, and ultimately, if that will have an impact on their uh, physical and emotional well-being as well. Perfect. And as we wrap up, any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience? Jacqueline? I, I don't know if I have any... Um, uh, I, I just, I really appreciated getting to talk to you both and, get, you know, to get to share... Um, this important topic too at the group. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lustig? Yeah, I will add, first of all, Jacqueline, I, I found your research to be fascinating and it, it's, it, it's such an important area that it really has been uh, neglected. So I'm, I'm glad you are doing this work. Um, the thing I would leave people with, if there's one piece of advice I would have, it's uh, at this point in time, more than ever, uh, forgive yourself because nobody is doing as well as they would like to be doing or expect to be doing. Um, we are all struggling at this point, everybody, uh, whether it's balancing different things in our lives, dealing with financial worries, health concerns, uh, recovering from recent political turmoil, climate change. Uh, I mean, there's just so much going on. And so the importance of giving oneself a little bit of grace and forgiving oneself uh, and knowing that nobody is truly doing okay in the way that they would like to be doing, I think goes a long way towards uh, self-acceptance, gratitude for what we do have, uh, even gratitude for the chance to uh, all be together. So don't sweat the small stuff. I feel bad, for example, that I haven't thrown a log on the fire behind me there in the last hour, but I'm going to try to forgive myself for that and uh, gear up for the Q&A with all of you. So delighted to be here with everyone. and uh, Thanks for having me back. Thank you. No, thank you both. This is this is um, an amazing conversation. Do we have any um, questions from the audience? And Beth, we are going to actually take those questions in the Whova platform. Okay. So if you oh. do have questions, folks, you're welcome to um, add those in the Q and A section for this session, and we'll go back into the app afterwards. This was a great session, um, Beth. And uh, panelists, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye. I like the uh, feed the fire when you can uh, comment there. You can take your time. And take your time, that's right. Lovely. That was very, very poetic. I really appreciate that. We're gonna go ahead and um, say hello to our next
session. Um, and actually, Dr. Lustig, I have to just say thank you for your sense of humor always. Uh, always so fun. And in, in case anyone was wondering if um, uh, where the, the idea for the fireside chat background came from, it was Dr. Lustig. So, <laughs> Dr. Lustig, thank you for the great idea. We were getting My some pleasure, comments Mr. about Card. <laughs> how fun that was. So thank you all. What um, a great session on sort of the cutting edge research on loneliness and resilience, maybe more important than even understanding loneliness is a resilience factors. And um, Dr. Lustig, please do also thank Cigna for being um, the first in the space to really look at loneliness and resilience in the U.S. Um, really remarkable leadership and information that we really need. So thank you all, Beth, thank you for um, moderating the chat and Jacqueline for all the work you're doing in Utah to study this important topic. We look forward to following the latest from all of you as our work goes on together.